Well, it is that season at uh, Heritage Bible Church. It is our tradition to answer questions most of the month of August, and uh, the 2024 edition of that has begun. If you missed or um, missed some of Scott Basolo's message last Lord's Day, it was a wonderful, wonderful foray into this adventure of answering questions. You know the adage, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for the day, and if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Well, you can answer a question and teach for the day, or you can show people how to find the answers to your questions and teach them for a lifetime, and uh, Scott definitely did the latter uh, last week. As we do this, just remember, it, it's never a matter of what is my interpretation, what is our interpretation. The, the thing that matters is what is the meaning, the meaning of God's Word, the singular meaning. God's Word means exactly what the inspired writers of Scripture meant for the people to whom they wrote to understand. That's the meaning. And then from that, we extract the principles, and from the principles, we extract uh, the applications. But we always need to dig for the meaning. Now, we got in uh, uh, a big batch of the questions. Scott and I sat down and organized what we would do last week and, uh, and this week. We need to do that again, finish up the rest of the questions that, that came in and how we will divide that for parts um, three and four. I don't think there'll have to be a five, but uh, we'll, we'll get all of these um, questions dealt with. So let's take an easy one to get going today. Uh, the theme today is end times things uh, and one event primarily in the picture. Question comes in, does the Bible teach the rapture? And if it does, when would that occur? I've had this question many times. It's, it's a legitimate question. It's an honest question. We want to know, what is God's plan for this world? What is God's plan for His church? What is God's plan for me? What's my future with Him? These are honest and important questions. And I, I want to say at the get-go, um, I'm going to take you to 1 Thessalonians 4 and answer this question. But for a much more thorough study, I would commend to you that you review three sermons that I preached on 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. It's in our 1 Thessalonians file in the sermons at hbc-boise.org. Well, let's take the first part of the question, does the Bible teach the rapture? The answer to that is really easy, yes. Now, there are some Christians who obsess about the rapture. Some uh, make movies about it, write books about it. Some ignore it. Some deny that it is taught in the Bible, and some are sort of scornful when they even hear the, the word. There are some of those who reject what the Bible says about it, and they use the term uh, as a, a term of derision that some people teach a secret rapture. And one of my favorite Bible teachers, I heard him on the radio use that expression, and that's absolutely absurd is it's not a secret, it's in the Bible. God made it known to us. So it's not a secret that way, but I think what they mean is, well, there's going to be this secret rapture that nobody sees or knows about that's coming. Well, um, it's not going to be a secret. Worldwide, shout, trumpet, angelic activity, and, 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 and hundreds of millions of people vanishing. That's not going to be a secret. That's going to be a great big deal. So let's take a look at it. The, the last two chapters of uh, 1 Thessalonians deal with some questions and some issues that were faced by the believers in the, the new church, the young church at Thessalonica, especially regarding end times. Paul wrote this letter to them about A.D. 51, very shortly after he had been there. This is probably the second earliest book of the New Testament, and we know he had to have taught them some things about end times because they had questions to, um, to follow up. It's pretty easy to ascertain what question Paul was addressing uh, what question prompted this little paragraph from Paul. It would have been something like this. In light of the imminent return of Christ, 
what will happen to believers who have died after believing in Him? They understood the concept that Christ will return for His own. They understood the concept that Christ will set up His kingdom on earth. But what about the ones who had died before, or died after believing in Christ? It could very well be that this question came after the death of the first one, first believer in Thessalonica uh, to die. So um, we have an explanation of what. Um, is the most direct part of the answer to that question. I just want to take you to three verses. The paragraph is actually a little bit longer than that, but three verses that explain an important um, sequence of things that will happen. And understanding this is going to help you with grief, uh, help you to face things with hope, help you to have comfort concerning the fate of those who die in the faith. The, um, the doctrine of the rapture is all tied up together with comfort, as we'll see right in this passage. So, 1 Thessalonians 4.15. As I say, the paragraph starts a little bit earlier, but the question was, does the Bible teach the rapture? And it does. So, let's dive in at 1 Thessalonians 4.15. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. Okay, so what about those who've fallen asleep, who've died in Christ? Well, um, we're not going to go anywhere before they are. That's the answer to the question. And Paul says, I say this to you by the word of the Lord. Now, we have no recorded statement. You can go read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the recorded words of Jesus. We don't have a place that he taught about the rapture. So what Paul was referring to is, by the word of the Lord, God revealed this to Paul. There's much of the teaching of the New Testament that God revealed through Paul. Almost everything about the body of Christ came through Paul. This was part of what God taught Paul um, privately and then used him to write it in his word. So the word of the Lord was given to him by Paul. Now look at the phrase, we who are alive and remain. Those are very important words. They tell us that Paul believed that this event could happen, uh, could have happened during his lifetime. We who are alive and remain. You can't say that if you know that this thing is a couple thousand years away. So it's a, that's the concept that we call imminence. Nothing else has to happen, prophetically speaking, between now and then. Now, obviously, it didn't happen then. So how are we to take we who are alive and remain? Well, let me take a wild guess. Let's take it just as it sounds. This is the next event in biblical prophecy that will happen. The concept of imminence means it could happen at any moment. There are no signs that precede this event. Unlike the, the second coming, which follows many signs, which even Jesus himself um, spilled out. So, when you see people telling you that these are the signs that the rapture is very close, tune them out. Change the channel, close the book, throw it away. There are no signs uh, that precede the rapture. Now, do we see things lining up that make it more plausible that end times events could happen? Well, yeah. We're only the second generation that's been alive with an Israel in the land. There are a lot of things that, that, that couldn't have, we wouldn't say couldn't have, but, they, but they're much more doing what I would say is setting the table for this to come. So, um, this I say to you by the word of the Lord, God told Paul this, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. That word coming is another crucial word. It's the Greek word parousia. Usia is a um, uh, participial form of the verb to be. It's being Par is from para alongside. It's being alongside is the literal concept of the word. And it was used 
uh, in Greek literature prior to the New Testament, both for the moment of arrival of a king, and it was used for his subsequent visit if he stayed. So, we're looking forward to uh, the coming. You know, the, 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 the date is uh, November 8th, and that's when uh, Aunt Bertha is coming to our house. All right? And then you could say, and we remember her coming last year when she stayed the whole month of November. Both perfectly good uses of the word coming. It can be the moment of arrival, or it can be the, the stay that begins with the arrival. And so sometimes... This word is translated in English Bibles as presence, if the emphasis is upon the being present after the uh, initial coming. The context has to determine its precise meaning. And in this context, there's no mention of the king staying, quite the contrary. This is a rendezvous in the air at a moment in time. And when this event, take, event takes place, Jesus does not come to earth. He doesn't come to stay as he will at the second coming. This event is about believers going to be with the Lord Jesus. It's not about the Lord Jesus coming to be on earth. So Paul explains how it will work that we who are alive and remain shall not precede those who have died as believers. Look at the next verse, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Does that sound like a secret? With the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, there's a lot there. That word shout is a unique word. It's only used once in the whole New Testament. It, it is a, from classical Greek. It a, describes a command given by the highest in command. God's going to give the command for this to happen. And in this case, there are parallel phrases that follow the word shout and define it. This shout is going to be with the voice of the archangel. Now, the, as with the archangel, isn't there in the Greek. It, I think it's too bad that English translators in most versions have inserted it there. Um, at least the New American Standard and the Legacy Standard Bible uh, put it in italics so you can see it was added by the translators. And why do, I, why do I even mention that? Well, it just says, with the archangel voice, or the voice of an archangel. Now, we only know of one archangel. Only one is named in the Bible, Michael. So people think, well, you know, archangel, there's only one. It's got to be Michael. So we might as well put the there. The arch but you know what? We don't know. Michael may have colleagues. There may be other archangels. It may be a, a, a whole class of angels. So we can't say for sure. And it doesn't really matter for what the text is teaching us. But Jesus will come from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel, and I'm not sure what that sounds like, but it's going to be heard. I'm sure of that. And then he adds another description of this sound with the trumpet of God. Now, that terminology makes us think of Exodus chapter 19, verse 16, where remember when Moses went up to uh, the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, God blew a long trumpet from Mount Sinai on the morning of the day in which he gave Moses the commandments. That trumpet call got the attention of all the people of God to gather at the foot of the mountain. This one is similar. This one is to call to the living and the dead in Christ to assemble before Christ in the air. So, this trumpet call, this voice of an archangel, or this shout awakens and quickens the dead in Christ. The physical bodies of those who have died in Christ will rise at that moment. And again, that's not going to be a secret. 
He says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. First what? First before we rise. So this is the direct answer to the question about the dead in Christ. Not only will they not, will they not, not be left out, they will be raised before we who are alive and remain at the time of the rapture. The dramatic events yet to come, everything of future prophecy in the Bible begins with this moment. First, the dead in Christ are resurrected. Oh, I, I, I would just love to see the faces of the people who happen to be doing a graveside service at the cemetery when that happens. Um, and next comes the rapture of those who are alive, the rapture of all believers. Then comes the seven years of the tribulation. Then comes the second coming of Christ. Then comes the thousand-year kingdom of Christ on earth. Then the great white throne judgment. And then the new heavens and the new earth. Now, let me in insert a little aside here. I say this just about every year somewhere in the Provoke the Pastor series. Never, my friends, never choose the doctrine that you prefer because it sounds best to you. That is the worst way to do theology. Now, it's the right way to buy a car, go test drive a few. It's the right way to order off of a menu at the restaurant. But that's not how we study biblical theology. You have to study all the relevant passages, then understand what they mean, then look for how they fit together. That's doing theology. And it's not something that you just, you know, you go pick and choose what you like. You have to be driven by what the text says. All right, now look at verse 17, and let's get the rapture to actually be described. Verse 17, then, okay, then what? Then after the shout, after the trumpet, after the voice, after the dead in Christ are raised, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, where is the word rapture there? It's not. Rapture is an English word that comes from a Latin word, raptura, which is how the Latin Bible translators, starting with, uh, with the Vulgate, translated this Greek word, which is harpazo. If that sounds like maybe that could be where we get the word harpoon, it's because that's where we get the word harpoon from. It describes a sudden seizing of something. Uh, somebody came up to me after the first service and says, well, maybe the word harpy comes from that. Well, you know what? I looked it up, and it does, because that's where the, you know, the bird with the claws comes down and grabs the fish and, and, and seizes it, snatches it, if you will. It describes a quick snatching away. Rapture is the English word from the Latin translation of the Greek word harpazo. So, we will be caught up together with them. Them who? Them dead in Christ that just arose. So, you piece together the full picture. All who have died as believers in Christ are raised first, then all living believers are gathered with, gathered together with them. That's why this is usually referred to as the rapture of the church, because this includes those who've died in Christ and those who are alive in Christ. In other words, every person who has believed in Christ since the day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2, will all be taken to be with the Lord at that same time. And we will meet Him in the clouds in the air. Remember when Jesus ascended? Acts chapter 1, verse 9. They were watching. He rose up and he was received into a cloud. 
and they saw him no more. And it was, he will come again in the same way. So meet him in the clouds, in the air. It's the perfect description. And by the way, notice that phrase, always with the Lord. That uses the strongest Greek form of, uh, of with. It doesn't mean just in the vicinity. It, it's describing coherence, permanent unity, a oneness of the closest uh, uh, possible kind. And then the word always underscores the permanence of this relationship. When you're with the Lord, you are always and forever with the Lord. Now, if you had been worried about what would happen to the Christians who had died before you. And remember, we're talking about a church in a situation where that might have been one or two people. But if you're concerned about what about grandma and grandpa who put their faith in Christ and they, and they died and Jesus hasn't come again yet, you would have a wonderful answer to your question by the time you finish verse 17. That's why verse 18 says, therefore comfort one another with these words. This is a great comforting concept. 1 Thessalonians is where the event we call the rapture is described most thoroughly. And it's where the word rapture comes into English by way of the Greek word harpazo via the Latin raptura. Now, there are three other places in the New Testament where it is described, not with the specificity of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but nevertheless, the same thing is described. John 14, verse 3, just before Jesus went away to, the, to his arrest, he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and, what? Receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That describes us being taken to be with Christ, not him coming to earth to reign, which he will, but that's at a different time. So we are being taken to be with Christ, received into Christ, if you will. Another one where it's mentioned, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. What is mystery? A mystery is something that is never before revealed. You won't find it in the Old Testament. It's made known in the New Testament. Paul received many of the mysteries to do with the church, the body of Christ, and this era uh, in which we live. And this one is connected to the resurrection of believers. It's toward the end of 1 Corinthians 15, which is the great resurrection chapter. And notice, behold, I tell you a mystery, and here it is again, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. That concept of imminence is required by the fact that this could have happened in the era of the Apostle Paul. There are no signs that precede this event. It could happen in a moment. I wouldn't mind if I don't finish this sermon. Just make sure you're right with the Lord before the rapture happens. Here's another place. Again, the, the procedure is not mentioned, but the concept is. For Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, Jesus dictated this to the church in the city of Philadelphia. And it says, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. That hour coming upon the whole world was the era of the seven years of the tribulation. And he says, I'm going to keep you from that. So that's the idea. Of, I'm going to remove you, hold you back, keep you away from that time. Now, next part of the question was, does the Bible teach the rapture? Absolutely yes. Now, some people choose not to believe it, 
Some choose to argue against it, but their problem was with God because it could not be more clear. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Now, when? As for the time of the rapture, there is not one passage that connects it directly to another event. No, no words like before this or after this or at that time. Uh, we have to weigh several things and again, study all the passages that have to do with all of the events of the future and then ask how they harmonize uh, with each other. And we have to weigh several things to come to a conclusion. And we do come to a conclusion. Again, I would refer you to our series in 1 Thessalonians 4 where you will find um, a lot more detail. I think the title of the three sermons is uh, The Fact of the Rapture, The Timing of the Rapture, and then The Rapture and the Rest of Prophecy. Um, if that helps you, uh, go for it. The bottom line is there are several considerations to weigh and I believe it's pretty clear they come down to the point that the pre-tribulation rapture position is most compelling. What do we mean by pre-tribulation? Before the tribulation. That the rapture happens and then the seven years of tribulation, which includes all of the signs of the second coming and then the second coming of, of Christ. I, I would commend to you um, that you... Uh, may, might want to look at uh, John MacArthur and Richard Mayhew's books, uh, a book including, um, or it's called uh, Biblical Doctrine, uh, with the, the, we, the big thick white book. We call it The White Whale. Uh, we call the ladies who study it The White Whale Women, but don't tell them that. Um, we're not here to castigate or uh, mock or separate from fellow believers who hold to a different view, but uh, if anybody can refute the seven lines of evidence that are there, um, I, I'm, I'm willing to listen. I've studied them many times, and um, I find them very faithful to the passages involved. Um, now, let me give you a, a very helpful comparison that shows, I think, definitively the rapture and the second coming are not the same. Let's just put them in two columns, all right? Uh, first column, the rapture, you'll find it in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, John 14, and then there's the allusion to, uh, allusion to it in uh, uh, Revelation 3.10. Second coming, crystal clear in detail in Revelation 19 and in Matthew uh, chapter 24. Now, what happens at this event? Well, in the rapture, that removes believers from the earth. At the second coming, unbelievers are removed from the earth. Now, everybody understands that the second coming is when Jesus sets up his kingdom. Now, let me ask you a question. If you remove all of the believers and you remove all of the unbelievers, who's on earth for the kingdom? Nobody. That's a huge problem. And so people make up some things about how there's going to be mass conversion in a split second. Okay, believe that if you'd like. I don't think it fits the Bible. Then we have the fact that in the rapture, Jesus returns to heaven with believers. He comes and gets them and takes them to be with him. And in the second coming, Jesus comes to earth and brings believers with him and they all stay on earth. At the rapture, Jesus comes and claims his bride. At the second coming, Jesus brings his bride with him. The rapture immediately is followed by the tribulation. You could say it brings on tribulation, whereas the second coming brings in a kingdom. The rapture has no signs. It is imminent. The second coming is preceded by many discernible signs. The rapture precedes the day of the Lord. The second coming is part of the day of the Lord. Now, we haven't talked about that this morning, but I'll say a word about that in just a minute. The rapture relates specifically to the church. The second coming relates to Israel and the whole world. The rapture is a mystery only revealed in the New Testament. The second coming was revealed extensively in the Old Testament. 
at the rapture, believers are rewarded, or after the rapture, believers are rewarded. After the second coming, unbelievers are judged. At the rapture, um, creation is left uh, unchanged. And in the second coming, many changes are made in creation. Many of the pre-flood conditions are going to be uh, restored at that time. The uh, rapture is before a time of wrath. The second coming is after God's wrath has been poured out, Revelation 6 through 19. At the rapture, only believers are involved. The second coming, everyone on earth is involved. And then at the rapture, believers alive go into Christ's presence, whereas at the second coming, believers who are alive go into an earthly kingdom. I just don't see how you can be um, honest with all of those passages and say those two events are one and the same. It, it, they, it just does not fit together. The distinctions are very obvious. Now, let's go to a related question. That one's a little bit theoretical. Um, you can believe in a post-tribulation rapture or a mid-tribulation rapture or a pre-wrath rapture or a partial rapture and wind up being pleasantly surprised when you're taken in the rapture, that's okay with me. But how about something really, really practical? Remember the question, obviously, in the church at Thessalonica? What about grandma and grandpa who believed in Christ and they've died? Are they going to get in on all of this stuff? Are we going to precede them? Well, there's a question on the other end of life as well. What about my children? What about our precious little baby? What about an unborn child? So the question is, will unborn children and children under the age of accountability join us in the rapture? And then the guy very nicely said, thank you. I appreciate his faith that he would actually like what I was going to say. <laughs> Well, let me say, this is, this is one of those rather rare questions for which I believe strongly there is a very clear answer, but there's not a specific passage that spells out that answer. It doesn't say anything about that in 1 Thessalonians 14. But don't let that cause you to worry about children being left on earth without parents to face the horrors of the tribulation. I don't believe that's the case. You might call this, therefore, informed speculation, but if you like, but I'd like to call it um, good reasoning from Scripture, and I think the conclusion is sound. Notice the question is tied to the concept of the age of accountability. That's the concept, by the way, also not stated anywhere in the Bible. That's the concept that, that you, you mature to a point at which you then become personally accountable for believing in Christ or rejecting Christ, uh, called the age of accountability. Um, I don't believe that there's a specific time you, uh, you, you see in various cultures different times of transition from childhood to adulthood. The best known one is in the Jewish culture. You reach age 13 and you become bar mitzvahed or bak mitzvahed, where you become a, a son of the covenant or a daughter of the covenant. You then are responsible to respond to God. Now, by the way, here's a little, here's a little freebie. Our society has invented a middle ground here. The Bible knows of childhood and adulthood. We've added into that adolescence. That's not in the Bible. You're a child or you're an adult. You're responsible or you're not. You're accountable or you're not. Um, and and that is what, that's what we need, what we need to practice. We've, we've invented adolescence as a way to kind of excuse a whole bunch of behavior that we don't want to admit we're responsible for or that our kids are responsible for. Um, think on that. That's a whole, that's a whole different uh, subject. But we need to teach children to come to know the Lord. That's the whole point of that. But that age of accountability in, uh, in, in Reformation 
post-Reformation churches, sometimes they still baptize children. Got big problems with that. But that's like you baptize children and then you get your, your discount card that lets you be able to someday cash that in and get saved. And in the meantime, you're, you're trained and you're taught and you maybe go through catechism or believer's class or, or, or whatever. And then you are confirmed. What they're saying is, you are now mature enough, you are accountable directly to God for your response to the gospel. That's the age of accountability. I don't think it's a specific age. I do think there's a concept. I think that the uh, point of development and the development of cognitive, of, um, cognitive uh, faculties varies greatly between in individuals. I think there are, are some people who perhaps never reach that point in their, in their development, and some very young. I've, I've had nine-year-olds that can articulate the gospel and their testimony of faith in Christ, um, and I've had 29-year-olds that can't articulate the gospel, um, but they ought to be able to. Let me, let me read you something that I think is a good summary on this. It's a good paragraph from a very helpful website, and I would recommend you might want to make use of this website from time to time. It's called gotquestions.org. Now, these are radical, sold-out Christians. They answer questions all year round, not just in August, okay? So you might want to write that down. Good resource, gotquestions.org. I've found them to be very biblical and uh, consistent and reliable. Here is, here is their statement, and I'll let this uh, finish answering this question. It is our view that children who are under the age of accountability will be taken in the rapture. If a child has not reached the point that he or she can make a decision for or against Christ, we would hold that if he or she dies, he or she will be granted entrance into heaven. We also hold that this principle, based entirely on God's mercy, applies to the rapture. Some propose that only the children of believers will be raptured. We disagree. If a child's salvation while under the age of accountability is not based on the faith status of his or her parents, neither is the child's participation in the deliverance of the rapture. It is our belief albeit not explicitly taught in Scripture, that all those under the age of accountability will be taken in the rapture. I think that's a good summary of the teachings of the Bible. I would also recommend to you another good resource uh, written by my friend John MacArthur, um, Safe in the Arms of God. He wrote this to help comfort parents who've lost a child to death. Um, but it has a lot of applications as well. This is one of those books that uh, uh, when, I, when I buy it, I always buy at least three at a time because as soon as somebody knows I have it, I give it away or I lend it and it gets lent and lent and lent. And I don't think I've ever had one come back to me. It's such a, it's such a good resource. You might want to uh, have one, actually buy two or three um, and give them away as you need to. Now, here's another question submitted on this same general subject of end times things, but it has a different slant that I think merits a comment, including how we go about dealing with these things. It's a long question. Um, I'll read it all and just let you see a little bit of it on the screen. The person says, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church and accepted Christ in my youth. Well, that's a good thing. Back then, it was widely accepted that the rapture and the second coming were one and the same event. Nowadays, it seems that there has been a slow departure from this position. I chalk it up to confusion concerning the timing of the Great Tribulation, but I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, it seems to have developed into splitting the rapture and return of Christ into two separate events. When I was younger, I stumped myself many times trying to explain end times events using the timing taught in my church while witnessing. To make it more perplexing, what my teachers were teaching did not harmonize with what I was reading in the Bible. The pieces didn't quite fit and or were left out. 
This led to an acute interest and personal study in end time prophecy. I wanted to have a smooth flowing explanation, one that encompassed all that the Bible says, and it says a lot. Unfortunately, now I frequently encounter many in the church who flat out refuse to discuss the matter. And I think that merits some, some comments. One, I praise the Lord for some parents in a church that led this person to, to faith at a young age. That's, that's wonderful. Um, that's, that's a really good thing. Another one that I, I hadn't written down, but I would say this, um, don't worry about trying to use prophecy to evangelize people. People don't have to be convinced about Bible prophecy. They have to be convinced they're a sinner and they're alienated from God and they need a savior. So go to the law of God. That's the bad news. We're all guilty before God. And then give them the good news, which is the gospel. I think that's a better witnessing technique. But I understand you can also very easily get sucked into a conversation about prophecy. But a couple of comments. First of all, I don't think that your experience in the Southern Baptist Convention is necessarily an accurate description of the development of the study of eschatology in the body of Christ. Um, that has been developed much more in the last, uh, in, in the last hundred years, but um, you know, I've been around uh, probably since before this person came to, uh, came to Christ, and the idea of the distinction between the rapture and the second coming is not new, has not been a gradual development. It's the result of biblical exegesis. And the, the Southern Baptist Convention is huge, biggest Protestant denomination in the world, but it's not the whole body of Christ, and, and, and it varies widely even among them. So I don't doubt that that was your experience, um, and maybe your church gradually slid in its position, but the position isn't new. Um, second comment, a better way to describe the harmony of all the passages is to see the rapture and the second coming both as a phase of the parousia, the coming, the return, the presence of Christ. Hence, that chart summarizing the distinctions. Both of them are referred to as the parousia, the coming or the presence. But finally, I wanted to say how sad that you ran into the frustration of dealing with people, presumably in the church, that don't want to discuss it. Well, you know, it takes time. It takes effort to put all of those pieces together, but it's important that we do. And I want to say, you know, whatever your experience, uh, whatever your upbringing, um, I hope you've landed in your final spiritual home here at Heritage Bible Church. Uh, and this is a place where these things are always welcome for discussion. Uh, you can go on our website and find our whole series on the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, two of them. I preached through them from the pulpit, and then I did them in more of a didactic way on, on uh, Wednesday night. There's another series on the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and uh, 25, where Jesus talked about eschatology. There are the eschatological sections of First and Second Thessalonians. Um, there are several past episodes of Provoke the Pastor in which we've addressed those things. And beyond all of that, I also um, wrote a course on eschatology, end times, Bible prophecy, for the Antioch Initiative and taught it in Russia. And I'd be happy to make that available to you. Just all that to say, this is not uh, secret. It's not mystical. It's big. It's complicated. And it's important. And if we can't talk about it, what are we doing? We need to be helping each other understand this. So, same person said, next, what is your take on 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2? My take is, I have no time to give you my take. We're about done. Um, he says, uh, to me, this section of Scripture sounds like our gathering together in Christ's return, the day of the Lord, are the same event and that they happen after the apostasy and the man of lawlessness is revealed, which happens after the restrainer, restrainer is removed. Well, I will refer you to um, our series on 2 Thessalonians, which is also available on our website. The short answer is the day of the Lord is not one day. And it's not one event. Um, 
it includes all of the events that begin with the rapture. And it goes on from there to include the tribulation, the second coming, the kingdom, the great white throne judgment, the new heavens, and the new earth. And again, I would say um, uh, C. Scott Basolo's message from last Sunday, you have to look for all the things that relate to this, the repetition of themes, the repetition of words, uh, the, the, the connections of all of it. All right, one more question in the last two minutes. This one starts out, I have heard John MacArthur say, I just love those questions. Jim, would you please explain John MacArthur? Yeah, he's my friend. Um, and, and pray for him, by the way. He's been going through some more uh, medical stuff. Okay, here's the question. I have heard John MacArthur say that the reason God created the earth was to demonstrate his mercy and grace to the angels. I don't doubt Pastor MacArthur, but I know he would encourage me to test what he says as well as anyone else with Scripture. I've looked and cannot find Scripture that supports that position. Please advise, and I love this, another thank you by faith. Um, well, I can think of one passage from which a statement like that might have been derived. I don't know exactly what passage or what sermon, you know, what, what context um, this person heard John, heard John say that. But what I thought of is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, which we'll soon be studying in men's and women's Bible study. It goes like this. As to this salvation... The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was, indi was indicated as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. He's saying the prophets were given these words, and then they actually studied their own words trying to figure it out. A Savior is coming, and He's going to suffer. A Savior is coming, and He's going to reign in glory. How can that be? Well, they did not have the revelation of first coming, second coming. Okay, so they were trying to figure that out. This is all about this salvation revealed to you. And then verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So, Take that whole long, complicated sentence. As to this salvation, which is things into which angels long to look. Angels do watch us. Angels rejoice at the salvation of any sinner. So, is this all uh, for the purpose of demonstrating His mercy and His grace to angels? I can see how that could be said, but I wouldn't limit it to that because there's certainly more than that. So, as Scott and I put together how we're going to divide this up, I got the end times stuff. He got the Old Testament stuff. We still got more left, and we will pick it up next week. But let me go back and read to you again the end of your Bible. Understand, this isn't just so we can draw prophetic charts. This isn't just so we can learn to counsel each other when somebody dies. Oh, there's so much more than that. Revelation 22, beginning at verse 18. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from them the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. So don't mess with this stuff. God means that. And he didn't mumble about the end times. He was very specific and very detailed and very clear. Then these words. He who testifies to these things, who's that? We'll go back and read Revelation 1. It's Jesus. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. And quickly is related to imminence. Amen. 
Come, Lord Jesus. And how much time have you spent paying attention to the very last sentence of your Bible? The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Amen means let it be. So be it. And even so, come, Lord Jesus. There are only two eternal destinies, the lake of fire, the new heavens and the new earth. You're going to be in one or you're going to be in other. The difference is what you do with the gospel, what you do with Jesus Christ. If you accept the free gift of eternal life or you reject it, that's what matters. As for me and my house, we choose to stand in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's pray. Father, how we thank you for the great riches of your grace in Jesus Christ. Thank you that as we go out into the world, we can bring the good news, which is the answer to the bad news of our alienation from you because of our sin. Put that news on our lips, we pray. Bind it to our hearts, we pray. And where there is any resistance on any of our part to what you would have for us to do in walking with you and growing in holiness and the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, oh, sweep those impediments away, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.